So uh, UV, right, that's going to be an important one for us. P is going to be important for us. N is going to be important for us. And I say all that because when we go back to what's going on here, this P here in our vertex shader is the same P that you're seeing in point attributes that happen in other places in touch. So that's this useful, useful to know. It's going to be really powerful for us here in a second. Okay, <sighs> wonderful. So the thing that we really need to do, right, is we need to figure out a way to be able to uh, grab a a value here from our texture, and in our case we're only going to use one channel of information, but we'd like to be able to use some information from our texture to displace our vertices, I'm, right? I want to move my points, and I want to move my points in a way that's consistent with what's going on in my texture. Uh, okay, Matt. Well, that's, uh, sure, sure, whatever you say. So, you know, let's, let's do that. Let's set up a few things here. So in, uh, in GL, one of the things we need to do is we actually need to declare data types explicitly. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and add a new float that I'm going to call dispz, as in displaced in the z uh, dimension. And I'm going to use uh, this function that's built into GL called texture. And texture is going to let us uh, find a pixel coordinate on our 2D sampler and correspond that with another or with another VEC2, and in our case, right, another XY position or a UV position. So what that means, right, so we're going to use texture. We're going to start with our disp text. That's the texture we want to use to look up from. I'm going to use UV0, and these are actually the UV coordinates, right? This is the UV coordinates from my grid, from my original piece of geometry. Zero is the first stack of UV coordinates because uh, geometries in touch can actually hold more than one um, sets of UVs. And I only want dot ST. I only want two of those. We could do XY. Um, ST is also a great way to, to get that out of there. This is called swizzling when you're, do, you're doing your Google, Googling search, Google searching. That would be the value that you'd uh, use to kind of look all that up. Now, our, uh, this whole process is going to return a VEC4. Oh, what's a VEC4? Oh, my gosh. Um, that shouldn't be scary at all to us. A VEC4, um, we deal with VEC4s all the time. Uh, and if we looked at, say, something like a constant top, this holds a VEC4, right? Because we think of our color as being an RGB and alpha channel. And that's really what our VEC4, or it's, uh, what a VEC4 really means for us here in GL is that it's a, um, it's a data type that position that holds four positions worth of data, right? So a pixel is a great way to think of that being a VEC4, right? A, a point might have a VEC3 as being its position information, right? Its X, Y, Z location is uh, in just that single point. You know, if we've worked with lists in Python, right, this is like a list uh, kind of idea, right? Instead of it being um, a, right, a, you can kind of think of it as a list of lists. So you've got one position in your list actually has four other values inside of it, right? Um, that gets really messy really fast. And so in GL, it's really handy for us to have these other data types, VEC4 being one of them. Okay, sorry, major diversion there. Anyway. So what we want to do is we want to look up from our texture. Uh, we're going to use disp text. That's the supplied texture we're going to use. We're going to use the UV coordinates coming from our geometry. And I only want the R channel dot R um, because I don't need any more information than that. OK, so if we save that, we should hopefully see that we still haven't encountered any errors yet so far. So good. OK, now what do we do next? Next, we need to make a new VEC3. So we're going to make a new VEC3, and this is going to be our new point position. And this is going to be comprised of our p.x, our original p position, p.y, our original y position, and p.z plus dispz. Right, so we've looked up a coordinate here. We're going to use that, and we're going to take our existing point, and we're going to add to it 
this the amount of displacement that comes from just the R channel here. We'll add a semicolon after the end of that, and nothing's changed. Okay. Well, what gives? The important thing to understand is that while we may have done that calculation, we're not using it yet. Because what we need to do is here in our deform is we need to use new P, our new point position, to represent where things are going to live. Okay. Doop. So now we can see, okay, it looks like we don't have any errors, and this is all displaced. If we apply that as our material, whoa golly, uh, we, we've got something, but that's pretty aggressive. Be aggressive right there. Okay, what are we what are we gonna do? Well, you know, one of the things to remember is that we haven't built in something to keep in mind here is that we haven't actually added any scaling mechanism. So we could let's go ahead and view that. We'll stick that up here in the corner. We could scale that here in our noise. So we could like, you know, come in here to our amplitude and like turn our amplitude down here and now we have this like great malarkey. Um, that's gonna suck though in the long run because it means that we've got to do all these texture operations to control what our displacement looks like and and to me that seems like that's a little bit overkill um, so let's instead let's add a vec2 to our um, GLSL material and in this case I'm gonna call this disp scale so this is our displacement scale now next thing we've got to do of course is we've got to actually have to add that uniform in here also. Uniform, and in this case, it's just gonna be a float, and it's gonna be called disp scale, right? So far, so good, no errors. We're gonna take this value, right? We're gonna take the, um, the pixel that we've looked up, and we're gonna multiply that by our disp scale, so we can scale that just a little bit. And now what we should be able to do is we should be able to control our displacement here, yeah. All right. Now there's a little bit of a funky thing happening in the way that we're sampling this. Um, and because of the, the way that UV coordinates work, right, we have a little bit of a discontinuity um, at our edges. We're kind of, we'll see this weirdness here at our edge, right, where we have, we have this break with our texture. Um, and that's okay, we could fix that with some more complicated math. Or for right now, for our sanity, let's go to our top, and the drop down here and our repeat, let's go to mirror for our U and Vs. Um, and we're gonna use that for the moment because that, that's gonna save us just a little bit of headache. Uh, and the edge case that it fixes for us and the way that it makes it pixel perfect for us, um, I don't think is quite worth it for this particular application. There are many applications where it would be really important. In this one, I think we can let it go for right now. Okay. So there we've got that business set up. Um, okay, great, wonderful. So what happens if we transform this? Let's go ahead and uh, add a little transformation and let's do it first in X. Ab time seconds. Whoa, hello, you are so fast. Um, and let's slow that down, say maybe multiply that by 0.1. Now, we might notice if we get close here, that there's a little bit of some chunky movement in this. We're going to see like some ka 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 and if we go slower we'll see it for sure. We can see this inconsistent kind of jerky movement and that's because we're just not at a high enough bit depth. If we crank that up to maybe like 16 um, bits or if we go up to 32 bit we're going to need to see much smoother motion now here in our points in their translation. Okay which means we could you know do something like turn this speed back up yeah, killer. All right. So now we have a pretty interesting set of points that are being displaced, right? Our grid points are being displaced um, based on a texture. Now you're gonna say, so what now? Well, let's let's look at like maybe movie file in instead. Now I'm gonna go ahead and for our own sanity, I'm gonna constrain the proportions of this. So I'm going to use a fit top, right? And we were operating at 100 by 100. So I'm going to go ahead and turn this down to 100 by 100. We're going to do a little fit outside. So 
Scoots right in there and plug our banana in instead. Ha, and now our banana is in here as our particles instead. All right, well, you might say, okay, that's all well and good, Matt, but I want to more than that. Okay, fine. Let's grab maybe like one of these nature movies. All right, well, now our nature movie is driving this thing. You might say that's well and great, Matt, but you know, what's our performance look like? Well, let's go ahead and our fit top. Um, well, let's turn this up to something like a thousand by a thousand, right? So we've got a million points now. And let's not hesitate to do a thousand by a thousand here. And I'll take a minute for the, the first set of computations to happen, but we'll, we can see now that we're displacing all these points. You know, this million point um, grid right at 60 frames a second, not even bat an eyelash. So now things start to get really interesting and fun. Um, they get real weird here real fast. Okay, let's plug our texture back in here instead. Right, we start to get this real fun, crazy noise scape. The more that we play with our noise, the more interesting it's gonna to start to become. Um, we might also think about, all right, we're gonna just turn this down for a second for our sanity and for the sake of our performance. There we go, excellent. Um, the other thing that we might look at is we might go ahead and open up the palette. And in the palette, uh, if you haven't seen this, this is a just a beautiful little uh, gem that's hidden in here. Uh, and it should be called, if I can remember the name of this thing, I think it's just called Noise. And I think it's in Generators. Yeah, killer. Okay. Um, and the reason why I bring this up, let's go ahead and um, route this into our fit and then route that here into our normal. Great. All right. So there's lots of different noise types in here that we might be able to start to draw from. Now, let's animate this cellular 2D noise. Let's make sure it's 3D noise. We can add, animate it in 3D and let's use time seconds. And let's also turn down our displacement just a little bit. Yeah, okay, looking good, looking good. And then in our noise, right, we might decide that we want to do things like uh, change the scale of this. Yeah, that is jamming. And let's take this out of here and maybe put that in X. And let's add another one in Y here, but let's make it go much slower. And we could even probably go a little faster here. So if you're looking for a way to like maybe have some interesting waves, right? Some kind of wavy textures. This is a really fun way to get to some of that. Um, and again, the more you manipulate and start to think about how you're using the noise that's to drive this, the more interesting uh, kind of applications you can end up with. And there's all sorts of really fun playful noise in here. This Cubus 3D noise is one of my favorites. Um, there's a whole bunch of different Perlin noises. There's these star noises, right? Those are fun. Um, these Hermite noises are really interesting in the way they present and they show up. This is really the foundational kind of place where we can start to uh, experiment with what noise displacement is going to mean here inside of Vertex Land, which is real real exciting and it's highly performant on top of all of that. Now there are a few things to keep in mind. Um, as we saw earlier, if, let's turn the turn this back up again. Let's go back up to a million. Verts, um, we're gonna see different performance when I'm zoomed in right here versus when I'm zoomed in out here, right? We've gotta remember that this whole kit and caboodle, all of Touch's UI is largely rendered in GL and so you know, every one of these containers has a cost associated with it in terms of rendering and its update time. So as we start to get into these high density meshed informations, uh, working in perform mode or turning off uh, viewers becomes really important because that helps throttle how much work is actually happening behind the scenes. Um, 
and we'll see you know that that's especially true later as we start to look at some some other things um, in the meantime you know you can always turn down your densities or you can uh, start to think about how you control how many operators you're looking at at any given point using this these techniques and performance again uh, one of the things I should really stress is that uh, it becomes incredibly valuable and incredibly important to build your network in a way where you're actually driving it through a UI rather than driving it in terms of a um, real-time network manipulation because live coding with something that's this complicated, uh, it's really easy to see performance hits uh, quickly if you haven't really done your due diligence and thinking about the way it, that it works. Anyway, all of that, great, 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 blah, blah, blah. We've talked too long. Um, but we've now built our first kind of noise displacement kind of situation here. Uh, we can go back to something that's a little bit less uh, aggressive and we can see what that might look like. And this will be the foundation for a bunch of things that we're gonna do here next because this is all well and good, but if we turn off our convert here for a moment, we've got this beautiful, um, grid that's displaced, but because our normals aren't displaced with it, it's only flat. And you better believe that if we're going to do something fun and exciting like this, well, we're, we're going to need a way to figure out how to get color onto this. We need a way to think about how we can get some more information onto it in terms of uh, recalculating our normals. Lots of other pieces that become really exciting and interesting here at the edge. Uh, and we'll dig into some of those next. So hold on to your socks. It's going to be real exciting.